Welcome. I am Bully. And tonight, I have gathered unbridled rage, uh, toxic pollution dumped into a pristine river, and a weapons-grade fursuit. And with these things, I have summoned Werewolf the Apocalypse 5th Edition. This is not a review, a full tutorial, or a comparison of older editions. Uh, in fact, this edition is explicitly not a continuation of older editions. This is for people who want to know what the game entails. See what I did there? Um, I'm sorry. I'll be doing a condensed explanation of the lore, uh, the gameplay, and the mechanics. There will be other videos with more in-depth looks at these concepts, as well as full tutorials on how to play and run the game. First of all, what is Werewolf the Apocalypse? So this game is about werewolves. Uh, werewolves are fighting against a physical and spiritual apocalypse. They're fighting to claw back the world that is already undergoing this destruction. Uh, they do so with radical and righteous violence. This is a game of consequences, a game of environmental horror, a game of raging against impossible odds. In this game, you play as Garu, or werewolves. Uh, the lore calls them Garu because it's not quite the same thing as how a lot of media portrays a typical werewolf. Garu have distinct lore and origins. Garu are shapeshifters. They are part man, they're part wolf. Um, they start as one or the other until eventually, upon reaching an age of maturity, they undergo their first change, the first time they shapeshift into this what we think of as a typical hulking monstrous werewolf creature. As Garu, they are chosen by Mother Earth, by Gaia, to be the protectors of Gaia, and all that entails bringing balance to the world, both physical and spiritual. Uh, Garu are not lycanthropes in the traditional sense that they have a transmittable condition or curse that's passed from one to another. In fact, in this edition, their origins are unclear. Geru are typically defined by a few key aspects. One of these is their auspice. Auspice is whatever the phase of the moon was, the night of their first change. This determines sort of their role in Geru society. Uh, then there's their tribe. Each tribe is a patron spirit. Um, so whatever spirit either called to the Geru or whichever one they sought out and decided to pledge themselves to, that determines a werewolf's tribe. Uh, there's also gifts, which are powers essentially, uh, bestowed upon by various spirits. Uh, and then there's renown, a Geru's reputation, uh, sort of what builds their legend as a creature fighting for Gaia. Geru have multiple forms. Uh, they don't just change from man to wolf. Uh, there's actually five different forms that a Geru can shape change into. Uh, each have their own advantages and disadvantages. These five forms are the Hamid form, or pretty much the, the human form. This is the origin form for the majority of Geru. Uh, in this form, they can't regenerate health, uh, but they're also not harmed by just touching silver. There's the glabro form, which is humanoid, but they're bigger, hairier, a little more creature-like. Not full half-man, half-wolf. Uh, basically human, but a little more physically imposing and bestial. There's the crinos form, which is what we think of when we think of a, a werewolf. This is a lot of the art you're going to see about this game is the hulking, monstrous creatures. This is called their war form. These are... The pinnacle of what it means to be this creature of rage and violence uh, capable of fighting all sorts of enemies. Uh, this is your quintessential werewolf. Uh, in this form, a Geru is very good at violence. Um, and that's pretty much what they're built for. They, and here they destroy things and don't do much else. There's the Hispo form which is a quadrupedal wolf creature. It's pretty much a dire wolf, like a wolf, but a bigger, scarier, uh, unnaturally large and ferocious. And then there's the lupus form. Lupus form is more or less indistinguishable from a regular wolf. Uh, this is also a form that some Geru uh, start as. 
the three forms in the middle are the supernatural forms, the Glabros, Krynos, and Hispo. In these forms, a Geru can regenerate health, uh, they can use gifts and powers, um, but they're also more affected by silver and things like that. And there also requires rage to fuel uh, these forms. Geru belong to tribes. Um, tribes are not monolithic uh, organizations of Geru. Uh, a tribe is more determined by whichever patron spirit uh, the Geru chooses to pledge themselves to. Um, tribes in this game sort of represent the archetypes that your werewolf is going to be. A tribe determines a, a favor that the character will have as well as a ban that the character will have and then also will uh, affect some other things they have access to. Most tribes have sort of typical outlooks or stereotypical outlooks that are influenced by these spirit patrons. Um, comes with their own worldviews and calls to action associated with each. Uh, but of course the individual Geru might have their own sort of takes or convictions uh, within those archetypes. What all the tribes have in common is they all serve Gaia and all serve to protect her. There are 11 tribes that the Geru can belong to and that you as a player are going to make a character that falls within one of these tribes. They are as follows. The Black Furies. Uh, they oppose injustice. They seek to correct it uh, wherever they find it. Uh, they're also known to uh, not be afraid to escalate situations in their pursuit of whatever their goals are. Uh, their patron spirit is the Gorgon. The Bonars, uh, this tribe, are they hide in plain sight. They gather secrets and things like that. These ones are uh, a little better at blending in with human society. Their patron spirit is the Rat. The children of Gaia uh, seek to discover mysteries and learn truths, uh, especially about the apocalypse affecting Gaia and the Umbra, or the spirit world. Uh, their patron spirit is the Unicorn. Heart Wardens, uh, they seek to expand and cultivate uh, land and places of importance, and they practice uh, hospitality and also work as arbitrators between other Geru. Uh, their patron spirit is the Stag. Gale Stalkers, these are your, your hunters, your uh, stalkers, your trackers, uh, your survivalists. Uh, their patron spirit is the North Wind. The Ghost Council are sort of the tricky ones. They, uh, uh, they question things. They question authority and traditions and things like that. Um, they also aren't afraid to use subterfuge and using knowledge that they gain through their questions to further their goals. Uh, their patron spirit is the Horned Serpent. The Glass Walkers are the most adapted to the modern times. Uh, this tribe uses uh, technology and communes with modern spirits and... They're more comfortable dwelling in cities and things like that. Uh, their patron spirit is the spider. The red talons, uh, they strongly believe in protecting the weak and protecting uh, places from unjust encroachment and things like that. Uh, their patron spirit is the griffin. The shadow lords, uh, they value might over anything else. They believe that uh, one should use any means necessary in order to accomplish their goals. Uh, their patron spirit is Thunder, and they also, uh, I would have thought that was a really cool band name when I was in, like, junior high. The Silent Striders are nomads. Uh, they're also social creatures. They're able to sort of uh, adapt and learn from every place they're at, and specifically the people they run into. They're very good at gathering and sharing information because of their travels and these abilities. Uh, their patron spirit is the Owl. The Silver Fangs, sort of the, the self-appointed aristocracy of the Geru. Uh, they seek to inspire and lead other werewolves in this war. Uh, their patron spirit is the Falcon. There are other tribes in the setting, though these tribes are considered either too wayward or lost along their path and no longer are really accepted by uh, the Geru nation as a whole. Auspice. Auspice, uh, as I said, is the Geru's moon sign. This is whatever phase of the moon there was the night they underwent their first change. Um, and auspice sort of implies a character's role in Geru society. Uh, there's certain expected temperaments and responsibilities that come with your auspice. Uh, there are five auspices. 
they rag a bash, uh, question authority. They challenge uh, unexamined traditions and philosophies, and uh, they're not afraid to ridicule that which deserves it. The theurge are thought of as like mystics. They have a deeper understanding of the umbra. Uh, they understand and are able to foster relationship with spirits. The philodox, they preserve and interpret uh, customs and traditions. Um, in this game, a lot of the history and whatnot of Garou is muddied, but it's all oral. Uh, legends and stories passed down. The Philodox sort of interpret those, and because of that, they also uh, pass judgment based on the history and rules of the Garou. The Galliard, they promote legends of the werewolves. They honor exemplary Garou, and they seek to inspire others. The Auron are warriors. These are the werewolves who challenge enemies and face them head on. Renown. Uh, this is sort of a, a reputation. Renown represents uh, how well a character uh, holds up the ideals of what it means to be Garou. Uh, this is something that you'll seek to build and earn during play. And everything to their, their just actual reputation that's spread among the Garou to how well uh, spirits and other supernatural denizens respect them. Uh, this is a measure of their contribution to Gaia and Garou society as a whole. Stories and legends, as I said before, are, are vital to Garou culture, and Renown sort of represents the impact of that specific character's legend. There are three types of Renown exalted by the Garou. Uh, these are glory, honor, and wisdom. These represent the core values that unite Garou society. Glory upholds uh, bold, resolute, uh, action-focused deeds as most desirable. Honor is about righteousness, respect, and sticking to one's principles. And wisdom involves uh, caution, cleverness, and sensibility. Another thing Garu will have to keep track of is Horano and Hoglost. Uh, these are mental states that can afflict and uh, temp and essentially, eventually, uh, take Igeru completely out of this war for Gaia. These represent when Igeru sort of loses either purpose or drive that's essential to being Igeru. Some Igeru succumb to these kind of fatalist outlooks that uh, either destroys their resolve or their rage and the things that they need to fuel them in their war for Gaia. Horano is a state of hopelessness and defeat. Uh, it's when a it just everything seems futile. Uh, if Figeru experiences too many setbacks or just feels like their efforts are not actually making an impact in the seemingly impossible war, they can slip into Horano and essentially sort of uh, give up. Hoglost is sort of the other side of that. This is what happens when a werewolf... Uh, still has the drive, but they lose the compassion, they lose the mercy, they lose that connection to protect other things that need protection, and they just become brutal fanatics. If a Garou falls into either one of these states, they are no longer viable warriors in the War for Gaia, and in game turns that means um, you can no longer play your character. There are gifts uh, along with their Different forms a Garou could shapeshift into. Gifts are sort of the other essential tools that they will be using in this fight. Gifts are abilities and sort of powers that are gifted to them by different spirits. The gifts available to any given Garou is determined by their tribe, their auspice, and their renown. Garou can also acquire talismans, which are essentially just physical objects that are inhabited by spirits and typically grant some sort of gift as well. Some gifts have wildly supernatural effects and powers, and others are more subtle and just sort of boost uh, different mundane characteristics of the Garo. Rage. Rage is essential uh, for Garo, and it's sort of the, the tragedy of being a Garo. Rage is what fuels that, that spirit wolf inside of them. This fury, this thing that fuels them, is sort of double-sided. Um, it's this raw, destructive force, um, but it's often hard to control, and sometimes it leads to things like frenzy and things like that, to where a Garou 
might not be able to direct this destructive power uh, towards the targets they intended. And also, it's it has a lot of implications that at the very core, the essence of your being is just to be really, really angry. Uh, that, it's a lot to deal with, a lot to navigate with that as well. Uh, mechanical terms, uh, things like shape-shifting and using gifts require the use of rage. Rites. Uh, rites are these, these traditions and rituals that sort of are, are shared and hold together Garu society. Different packs and tribes have different ways of conducting these rites, but uh, the purpose of them is sort of recognized by all. Uh, rites vary greatly. Some of them are very formal, serious, rare uh, rituals that happen. Uh, others uh, can be more uh, social and regularly done when, when Garut meet. There's things like a there's a right to mourn the loss of a warrior, and there's rights just on how to tell uh, certain stories and legends to inspire other Garu. In their simplest form, a rite is essentially sort of a, a, a ritualized form of social interaction unique to Garu culture. Some of these are simply just important in the lore and for storytelling purposes, and others actually have mechanical in-game benefits. Werewolves belong to packs. Um, if you're playing this game, your character, you and the other players, uh, all of your characters will be part of a, the same pack. Werewolves are social creatures um, in their own way, and they don't really stand a chance in this impossible war for the world uh, without the support of a pack at least. Garu normally seek a pack to serve as their uh, social system and also to uh, support in their service to Gaia. Packs also are a way to sort of encourage synergy between like the different auspices and tribes and gifts and things like that. Um, it, Tribe seems like a, a one tribe would stick together, and they do in some ways, but a lot of times uh, a pack composes of all different tribes, all different moon phases and things of that nature. Uh, they're typically stronger when they can sort of complement each other's strengths. A lot of times these are sort of found families, uh, and also sometimes they're formally uh, organized by Garu elders. Packs also typically have a pack leader. Uh, though how that's determined and what those responsibilities are are going to vary from pack to pack. This is an interesting thing to explore uh, as a player because it means one of you uh, might be the leader and that could be a rotating role or uh, that could be a point of sort of contention and could have a lot of good story beats that go with that. Then there are sets. Sets are multiple packs working together in a group. That group's called a set and that group... Uh, protects cairns. Uh, significant cairns might even have multiple sets protecting them. Which brings us to cairns. Cairns are places of great spiritual power. Uh, in these areas, the, the line between the spirit world and the physical world is very thin. Um, it's easier for spirits to inhabit the physical world and uh, easier for Garu to sort of interact with the spirit world here. These places are sacred to Garu. Uh, even humans can typically tell that there's something special about a place like this, so they won't understand the true nature of it, most likely. Garu, of course, are going to be very aware of when, when they're in the presence of a cairn. Um, and especially in the modern world, a cairn, a place where uh, the umbra, the spirit world, uh, is able to interact with the physical world so much is very rare and important to them. Of course, on all cairns are these ideal sanctuaries. Many of them also become corrupted by spirits and things of that nature, and it is up to the Garu to cleanse these places and reclaim them. There are moots. Moots are gatherings, meetings of multiple uh, packs and sets and tribes and things of that nature that usually takes place in a cairn. During moots, a lot of the rites are performed, traditions are observed, um, sometimes challenges are issued, and usually some sort of decisions are being made that affect uh, Garu as a whole, or at least those in that region. While moots are called for sort of emergency purposes, um, there are some that are just traditional uh, that align with different important events or uh, things of that nature. Moots are great opportunities in games for Garu to interact with other Garu. Um, there's a lot of information gathering that could happen here, uh, a lot of lore learning that can happen here, and also just some Garu on Garu violence, which always a good time. 
So that's what it, uh, what Geru are, what werewolves are in this game, what that means and what you're going to interact with and what makes up the important parts of a werewolf in Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, next, we're going to get into sort of the, the a little bit of the lores, the setting that you'll be playing in. Uh, a big thing is it, an apocalypse is happening. Uh, this isn't a game about preventing the apocalypse. In this game, the apocalypse is well underway. Uh, the apocalypse is a a physical and spiritual end of the world. Uh, the world to Geru being Mother Earth or Gaia. This is primarily believed to be brought about by uh, human greed and consumption and the spirits that affect and push those uh, machinations. There isn't a single like entity or organization that's bringing about the apocalypse. Uh, some purposefully know what they're doing. Others are just living out their sort of base nature, and that just happens to be adding to the problem without them realizing it. Ultimately, in game terms, what the apocalypse is is the imbalance of the triad. The triad are the cosmological spiritual forces that make up the existence itself. These forces are they're spirits, but not spirits in the sense that they have like their own will. Um, they're, they're bigger than that. Uh, though there's others who sort of serve these forces uh, and they seek to further the nature of the specific triad entities. And then it's up to the Geru to sort of keep a balance between the three. The triad consists of the wild. The wild is creation, change, chaos. There's the weaver, which is order, structure, stasis, and then the worm which is a consumption, decay, and entropy. Um, some of these sound more evil than others, but uh, all have their purpose, and all should be in harmony for Gaia to uh, exist in a healthy way. There's the Umbra. The Umbra is the spirit world, or the spirit wilds. Uh, it all refers to the same thing. Uh, the spirit world in this game is sort of a, a reflection of the physical world. Um, it's affected by and caused by emotional resonance and things that happen there uh, in the physical world affect the spirit world uh, and also vice versa a little bit um, though it is sort of a, a like i said more of a mirror more of a weird reflection than like a whole different uh, plane of existence uh, it also obviously does not follow a lot of the new rules that the physical world does uh, there's a lot of weird, fun things you can do with that. Geru are beings with, with wolf spirits. Uh, they work with various spirits. They serve a patron spirit. So uh, they have, a, obviously, a lot of interesting relationships with the Umbra and spirits that dwell there. But uh, even so, the Umbra isn't necessarily a friendly place for Geru or anyone. Uh, just like in the real world, uh, the denizens there do not always have the same agenda or goals there's a delirium uh, so in this setting uh, this is what the reason why humans do not know about werewolves uh, delirium's sort of uh, it's an extreme terror or confusion that afflicts a human whenever they see a werewolf either be a werewolf or do werewolf things uh, the lore reason for this is that uh, once upon a time supposedly the Garu were uh, really overcorrected when it came to keeping the humans in line as they attempted to control things uh, in service to the weaver. And uh, humans for so long had such a primordial fear of Garu that that still sort of lives in, in all humans, even in modern times. So they might not really believe in werewolves, but just the presence of one interacts with something in a human that makes them essentially either forget what they saw out of just panic or justify it in some weird way also in panic so the nice thing is um you can slip up sometimes and the problem sort of solves itself as far as keeping it secret that you're a werewolf um but obviously mass panic and the more people affected by that are going to have some uh, interesting consequences uh, there's the geru nation which kind of isn't a thing anymore it's, a, it's kind of unclear but it's essentially uh, so Gera mostly organized at like a pact level or a sept level, uh, the protected cairn. Um, 
as I said before, tribes are not monoliths. Garu as a whole are pretty fractured. Uh, in modern nights especially, the Garu are often at odds with each other nearly as often as working against like the actual agents trying to accelerate the apocalypse. There's a lot of tension between the best way to fight against the apocalypse. And of course, since the apocalypse is happening, that means no one's really gotten it right or figured it out. So uh, there's not really an authority to point to this is what to do. Uh, people are still trying new ways and it's not really time for that. What binds Garus together, though, are the, the legends, the stories told of these uh, exemplary Garu throughout history, as well as rites and rituals and things like that that are still observed throughout almost all Garu culture. There's also the litany. The litany is a, a little more formal, like a set of rules and values that Garu are expected to follow. This game does an interesting thing with uh, the, the history of the lore. Um, again, we're not getting into other uh, editions, but they truly break away from uh, established uh, canon lore and whatnot. Um, there's no longer a true single known way of how Garu exists. It's, there's people with these wolf spirits in them. Uh, they're kin seekers who will werewolves that will seek out people with the wolf spirit and try to do something to get them to change and things like that. It's a whole kind of interesting thing. Uh, but essentially, no one's 100% sure how someone becomes a Garu, um, though there are like family lineages and stuff that sometimes is passed down through. So you know who you're playing as, you know the history and why you're fighting this war, but who are you fighting the war against? Uh, there's a, an interesting... Uh, selection there's a lot of different antagonists in this game essentially everyone's a problem for you to deal with and that's 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 the fun of it some of the bigger ones are banes these are spirits that serve the worm uh essentially these can take all sorts of uh, horrific powerful uh, just messed up forms which are really fun and um obviously these spirits uh need to be dealt with and they seek out to just spread rot and decay and the apocalypse and they will uh, if the Garu aren't seeking out to destroy them the Banes will certainly seek out the Garu to get to them uh, not even necessarily destroy them a lot of times corrupt them and then the Fomori are when a Bane possesses a human typically or there's other hosts that could be possessed by a Bane and once they're corrupted long enough they're just permanently warped into these uh, worm creatures worm with a Y. It's different. They could be worms too. Then there's the Pentex group. This is essentially just big evil corporate capitalism just cranked up and at the highest levels like they know they're serving the worm and these evil spirits but at the lower levels it's just rampant consumerism destroying the world. Uh, these are essentially just companies within companies that are exploiting, destroying, uh, and uh, presenting a really big problem for Garu to fight that might not be as obvious as being able to go out in the woods and uh, bite a spirit. These are companies to have to dismantle and fight against. There's many other supernatural creatures, uh, often at odds with the Garu. Uh, the, the vampires, for example, are, are no friends of them, as I'm sure you've guessed, um, as well as uh, all sorts of other things. And you think in a world where the Garu are like fully outnumbered and just uh, losing a pretty terrible war, that they'd at least be united. Uh, they're not. Uh, Garu themselves make for some interesting enemies or rivals and things of that nature. So they uh, seek to further their own legend or disagree on the best way to approach problems and things like that. Again, Garu are filled with rage and that, that everyone can get some. And there's also uh, what are called the Black Spiral Dancers, uh, kind of a tribe in a way. These are uh, Garu that have been corrupted by the worm. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, it's, it happens more than you'd think. So what, what do you do uh, besides this, this war we keep talking about and stuff? What's actual gameplay look like in this? <clears throat> um, uh, this is definitely, I believe, the most combat heavy of the World of Darkness splats. Um, 
Uh, hunters. Uh, now, uh, hunters, a lot of combat happens rarely because it's so dangerous. Uh, as a Garou is a werewolf, you are a killing machine and you kill. You are expected to kill and destroy often. So this is a good game for the more action-oriented players. Because the world is in such a bad state, both the physical and spiritual world, it also gives just a ton of options for how uh, you as players in your pack want to approach uh, the war uh, for Gaia and how you want to put your tools to use and making a difference. It's not always just explicit warfare. In the book's own words, uh, they state that you will fight to take back what has been lost. Uh, build your own legend, explore the mysteries of the Umbra, and look out for others of your kind. Uh, I think some things to add to that are you you also sort of discover what it means to be Geru, as well as navigating um, all of the, the, the politac politics and implications of that. It's also coming to terms with a world that uh, most of its denizens literally fear you, even though you're trying to protect them. Uh, I also really like the idea of building right now, building a legend. Um, of course, everyone wants to play like a cool character that people talk about, but there's mechanics for it in this game. Like being a, a legend, uh, even a martyr or things like that is, is deeply important, not only for Geru culture, but to inspire future fighters. Uh, the game can also be about like protecting and growing uh, these powerful Cairns. Uh, it's kind of a cool... Uh, I, I'm a sucker for base building, so there's a little bit of that as you you have this the spiritual place uh, that can grow and manifest and give you different gifts and of course will be sought out by uh, things to corrupt it or other Geru who think they can protect it better than you and things like that. So there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, gameplay around just territory. And ultimately, I think it's about just not going down without a fight. Uh, that's an interesting concept, I think, and uh, one that I that I get worried that some people will take this game as people will. I hear it all the time. Oh, it's World of Darkness as just like a go-to. Certain storytellers say when uh, the game just is such a bummer, and uh, but it's okay because it's supposed to be a bummer. But also we forget that it's okay for like the players to have fun. Uh, anyway, there's a whole complicated thing. Yes, it's an apocalypse. Yes. Everything sucks, uh, but also like find the fun in that, and uh, that's going to be an interesting balance and uh, something to go into with that mindset. What I think a typical gameplay or, or story will sort of break down into is you're forming a pack, uh, protecting a cairn, uh, building your renown, building your legend, trying to uphold the tenets that your group has decided on and then just waging war against these daunting odds and whatever that looks like for your pack. I do want to quickly go over some of the game mechanics for those unfamiliar. This game uses the storyteller system. So if you played Vampire the Masquerade or Hunter 5th Edition, um, you're going to be very, very familiar with this. Uh, the storyteller places a lot of emphasis on role-playing and building uh, complex and interesting characters and exploring the consequences that they're gonna face throughout the story. This system uses D10s or uh, special D10s that are specific to each splat. Rage specifically is the resource that the player is going to be sort of managing um, in order for the character to tap into the wolf spirit to shapeshift and to use gifts. Uh, Rage's note on a tracker, tracker sp uh, spans from zero to five. And this is going to fluctuate regularly during gameplay. Uh, once Rage reaches 5, going above that sets them into a frenzy. Uh, once a Garou has Rage 0, they've considered to have lost the wolf. And they can't use a lot of their abilities until they get Rage again. Shapeshifting and using gifts typically require one or more Rage checks. Where you roll a dice on a success, your Rage stays the same. Uh, on a failure, you lose a Rage. And for each point of Rage a character has... Uh, that represents one rage dice. So when you're making your dice pool, you're going to take out the number of dice and then replace that same number with rage dice because that increases the chances for brutal outcomes. Uh, one brutal uh, doesn't mean anything, but if you get two brutal uh, results on the dice, you now have a brutal outcome to whatever that roll is, whether it's a success or a failure. 
Uh, a brutal outcome, a brutal failure is essentially you failed in a just spectacularly destructive way. Um, unless the aim of what your, your action was was to destroy something, then you kind of can still accomplish it by having a brutal failure. Uh, in that instance, actually, the brutal outcome adds four additional successes. So you, you really destroy that thing or person. So basically, you, you roll two brutals. Congrats, you got four more successes to destroy something. Or congrats, you failed and you destroyed something you didn't want to. Uh, this is sort of the core mechanic to Werewolf the Apocalypse. And uh, I think it's really interesting. It represents the necessity for Garu to harbor rage, to have rage, um, but also represents the danger of having too much of it. So in closing, that's sort of the, the basics of Werewolf the Apocalypse 5th Edition. I, I talked about a lot, and I know and this is a lot more. Uh, this was just a real overview of what it's like to... Uh, what the game's about, what the werewolves are like in this, what the setting is like, um, what you can expect of the gameplay, and a rough idea of what the mechanics are. Uh, there's going to be other videos that dive into all these aspects, dive into lore aspects, uh, dive into gameplay aspects, uh, and then tutorials on how to play and advice on how to run the game. And if you're interested in playing yourself, uh, depending on when you're watching this, I might have some werewolf games on old start playing slash summon stories. That'll be something here. Or click, there's going to be a link in the bio. I don't know why I keep doing things where I create work for myself by doing little fun hand things that later I always regret. <sighs> That's the rage. For now, this chapter is closed and this ritual must end. Thank you for letting me in. And don't forget to close the door. This also reminds me. If I said any of these made up words, at least I think a lot of them are made up wrong. Sorry. But also... Now, you know what, sometimes I, I say stuff I should know, and I get, I, if you want to correct me, go for it, but you better be fucking right.